Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Chris Brown, and I'm the host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we will be sitting down with local leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. We believe that the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That's why we are honored to have our guest today. He is the chairperson for the Special Areas Board in Southern Alberta. Please welcome Chair Jordan Christensen. Jordan, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Chris. It's uh, certainly my pleasure to join you here today, and I, I feel like I'm in prestigious company. I've I've looked through and, and listened to some of the podcasts, and uh, yeah, you you do uh, have a very interesting mix of of uh, individuals that you interview. So it, it's my honor to be here uh, this morning with you. Well, thank you so much. And I want to. I, I usually start with the typical question, which I'm going to, but I then I'm going to jump into the heavy stuff. And sure. I guess the first question that I always ask anyone in uh, politics is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Because you were serving as the chairperson. So where did that desire to serve in that position come from? I, I knew you were going to ask me this question, Chris. I, I, knew this, I knew this was coming. Um, and I, you know, I, I wish I had this like noble answer to give you. Um, and, and I'll admit here that, you know, maybe how I got into this role was, was, was maybe by accident, really. Um, you know, what, what happened was, and again, I think it's, it, it kind of lends itself to the, the uniqueness of, of the role and the position as chair for the special areas board. Um, I mean, that position is, it, it, it functions in many different ways. One is administrative, one is kind of in the political sphere. And then also, I mean, there is a component that is a provincial public servant as well. Um, but I, you know, I I got into public service, I would say, um, out of university. I, I started working for the Special Areas Board um, when I graduated from the U of S. Um, a few trips around the sun ago now. Um, and I, and I uh, over the years, have had a, a number of different roles with the organization and um, just kind of worked through it uh, until 2015, I would say. Where I had an opportunity to um, to take this position as chair, and um, again, I, 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 you know, to so the question about where did my sense of duty come from, um, you know, it was really for me it was, um, you know, part of, uh, uh, you know, just I'll say blindly stumbling into it as as a job and working my way through it, um, but I think through that. Uh, you know, I, I I really developed a strong sense of and an appreciation for working in public service and especially local government. Um, like I, I love that direct connection back to the to the residents and, and the ratepayers of the region. Um, I truly believe that local government is the um, you know the, the the most grassroots form of government there is out there. I mean, we're just all so accessible uh, to our residents. Um, and so I think over the years, I, I developed that appreciation for, for government uh, by, by working here. And so then when I got an opportunity to, to serve in this role, um, it, it seemed quite logical at the time for me to do that. And uh, so that's kind of how I landed uh, here today. So sorry, I don't have this noble answer for you other than, you know, I, it started out as a job and it turned into a career. And um, I've just really enjoyed um, each and every day, honestly. So... Okay, there's a lot to unpack with that opening statement that you just gave there. And I want to start with the very first one. And that is, you have three hats that you wear. You are sort of the administrator, you're the chair of the board, but also you're a public servant of the province of Alberta. Um, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna ask the very stupid question right now, and I apologize for it right off the bat, but what does a special area board do? areas board do is it a municipality is it a local government in the broad scheme of it what is a special areas board um th that's a really good question chris and honestly there's no stupid question around this it like i'll i'll just recognize and acknowledge that that we certainly are kind of an anomaly in you know because you're the say, only one in alberta right only one in Alberta. We're the only one that I know of, even in Western Canada, maybe nationally, maybe from a continental standpoint that operates this way. Um, so are we a municipality? 
uh, yes, we we serve the function as a, as a local municipal government here. So um, I, I usually tell people, I mean, my kind of elevator pitch around this is we serve two functions. Um, one is uh, a municipal role, right? So we um, we supply, you know, any of the same services or deliver any of the same services that any other rural municipality would would in the province. Um, so it would be like, you know, roads and streets, um, wastewater, um, recreation, um, emergency services, fire services, um, all those all those um, kind of services that you would see in other rural municipalities, we deliver those. Um, the difference between us and other rurals is that uh, we are a provincial crown agency under um, Alberta Municipal Affairs. And so our connection back to the province really has to do with our second function. And that function is um, a public land manager. So, and this goes back to the history and the, you know, the um, initial creation of our kind of governance structure. Um, our, our second function here is we act as a public land manager in this part of the province. Um, so all the public land within the boundaries of special areas is managed by special areas board. So it's not managed by, um, I think today it's environment and protected areas. Um, like we, we don't have um, provincial oversight at that level on public lands here. Um, they are, are managed and, and administered by the board locally. Okay. So that, that's kind of the two functions, Chris, is municipal, and then we have a, another role as a public land manager. So the special areas board, from what I understand, according to your website, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because you're the you're more up on this than I am, was created out of the depression age, right? And that's when yep. the province set you guys up, and you have just operated as a special area board since, or special areas board since. Yeah. Your primary function. Well, there's two primary functions that you just talked about, which is the municipal side and the land side. I want to yeah. start with the municipal side here. And I want to know in your role as chair. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to actually rephrase this question because I want to know this before I get into that question. There's two type of councillors who make up the board. There's a special area board member and there's a special area advisory board. Yeah. Council. Do the councillors only do one side of that? Do they only do the municipal side and then the special area board members who are appointed by the province only do the land? How does your system, how does your governance system operate and how does it look like in an org chart? I find this fascinating um, and I apologize. It's just, sure. no, I no. love this conversation and we're only eight minutes in. So again, that's a, that's a really good question. And maybe what I'll do is I'll highlight um, the differences between our kind of governance model with, uh, you know, again, just a typical. Um, so let's municipal... say the city of Hannah, city of or the town of Hannah. They're not a city. Town the town, Hannah, town of Hannah, man, mayor, you... councillors. Yes. So you have a municipal election. Um, the residents of that community would elect a council to town council. And then that town council um, and there's two ways to become a mayor, right? Either it's uh, elected through uh, a municipal election or the council appoints somebody to be mayor, right? Um, so, so town of Hannah, they have a municipal election, they elect a council. Through that process, they get a mayor. Um, the mayor is the, the political lead yeah. of the community, right? Um, and then between the council and the mayor, um, one of their obligations or their responsibilities is to have a CAO, a chief administrative official, um, basically run the day-to-day -day operations of that municipality. Um, so that's how things would look like in the town of, of Hannah, for example. In special areas, we have elected councillors. So we have 13 elected councillors, and they're elected through the local um, authorities I think it's act. The, Elections Act, yeah, um, they operate in an advisory role. And so uh, we meet with them quarterly throughout the year. Um, the The overall, I'd say, decision-making um, um, powers are, are, are uh, by legislation or through the Minister of Municipal Affairs. So technically, our council is the Minister of Municipal Affairs, 
over the years, um, that minister, the ministers have delegated a lot of the authorities to the special areas board. So what happens is we have a municipal election, um, residents within special areas elect 13 council members to our advisory council. Then those 13 members on our advisory council, they nominate three individuals from that um, to appoint to the special areas board. And then those three elected members mm -hmm. are appointed to an order in council onto the special areas board. And my role is not elected. It is um, strictly an, an appointment by an order in council by government. And okay. I'm appointed as chair. So Okay. So you run the meetings though, right? As the chairperson, you're running the meetings for both the special area board members and the special area board advisory council as chair, right? Or is that a completely different separate uh, job description? Um, there, uh, I do, I do chair both those. So in our advisory council meetings, um, I chair those meetings. I don't have, um, again, because that's a, a meeting of our elected officials, our advisory council members. Um, I'm not elected. Yeah. I, like I don't have voting privileges at our advisory council meetings, but I chair the meetings and, and, uh, you know, help council, you know, guide through the, through that process. Um, my appointment though, to the board does come with voting privileges. So I have a vote on the special areas board, and I also chair those those meetings as well. So it it is it is very unique, and from an outsider looking, um, from an outsider looking in, uh, it 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 looks odd, but it actually functions, I think, quite well. Um, and you know, there's there's obviously pros and cons of it, but uh, I think all in all, it's a what what is the that... pros? What let's talk about the pros. What's the pros of having a system like you have right now? Um, I, I like I think there's like from the board perspective, Chris. I think there's there's a lot of balance. You know, like there's my role is really to walk the the I'll say the thin edge. Um, so you know, you have local concerns, and then you have this provincial, you know. Um, and now I'll talk about the the provincial oversight here. Um, like the province really doesn't, they're not involved in our municipal business, right? Like they let the board run, you know, as a municipality, a lot of the municipal decision-making authority has been delegated to the special areas board. That functions quite well. Um, where the provincial oversight comes in is on the public lands. So a lot of the decisions that the, the board makes on, on, you know, public land policy um, we do have to stick handle that through the department. Um, we have to get ministerial orders on, on our, like our annual rental fees. Um, if we're making big, you know, kind of public land policy decisions, um, we certainly involve the department on that. So, you know, and again, that's where I say there's, you know, advantages, uh, disadvantages. I think one of the advantages is, is the balance, right? Um, you know, you've got the, the provincial oversight there, but you've got, you know that that local representation. Do they ever clash? Um, um, certainly they do. Yeah, certainly, certainly they do. Um, and it's just again part of my role as chair is to find a path through that. And you know, quite often that involves compromise. Um, I think. Um, and I'm just I'm trying to think of an example where there's been conflict. Uh, and I wouldn't I wouldn't call it conflict, but it's just you know again there's a, a local. Um, because you know, the, pe the people who are elected as the advisory council are there to represent the people. Even if they're meeting quarterly, they're there to represent their people. You are yeah. appointed by the province, so you have to there for walk that line between what the citizens want, but also what yeah. the province needs, right? So yeah. I can imagine that is probably the thing that keeps you awake at most nights. <laughs> it it, yeah, it's certainly uh, like some days it, that that can be a challenge. But again, I you know I think that's one of the, you know I, I think one of the more interesting aspects about this job as compared to, um, you know, municipality. You know, like other rural municipalities do not they're not managing public lands. Um, you know, in special areas is large. It's very large geographically, right? What, do you very, know the size off the top of your head? Um, it's it's about you know I'll, I'll go in the old imperial system. It's it's over five million acres. Um, I think we we counted out it. If you know what a township of land is, Chris, it's I think it's uh, in the neighborhood of 220 townships of land. Um, so it's it, it's quite a vast geographical area, but um, very sparse population density. Like you know, What's the population. 
Uh, it's in between four and five thousand uh, residents. Rural. Okay. That doesn't include, okay. That doesn't I'm going to ask the question yeah. that I think it yeah. needs to be asked right now, and I think you know what it's going to be after that just statement there. Yeah. Why stay a special area board? Has there been uh, ever been? To, and I'm not. I'm not trying to put you in a spot here. Yep. It's just I think that's the the natural progression of if you have. I, I know rural communities that are five thousand people, and I can imagine that they're probably doing the exact same thing besides the land issue, the same thing that you're doing. So has there ever been discussion or are you guys just a okay with being an SAB? Uh, like we're, I think locally, certainly there is some sentiment out there that, that we should just incorporate into municipality. Um, I think, you know, kind of more broadly speaking though, I think generally, you know, the majority of residents that I speak to are very satisfied with the governance structure that we have existing out here um, right now. There there has been, um, you know, like I think, uh, you know, uh, back through like the the, the Jim Prentice governments, uh, Alison Redford, um, even through Nolly's government, like we, we were part of a, a provincial agency board and commission review. So we went through that process. Um, I'm going to say, you know, starting in I'll say 2015, 2016, somewhere in there, kind of wrapped up, I'll say 2018-ish, Chris. Um, and, you know, I think through that kind of uh, analysis, you know, government made the determination that there really is no need to change the special areas. Um, sorry, I think I lost track of your original question. You wanted to know just, why a special area is. Yeah, why special which you basically just said because residents just didn't, there was no appetite well, for the change because everything was operating a okay, and I, and I think it goes back to the you know our original history and why we were created. I think you know the point of special areas was to create stability through a time of turbulence through you know the late twenties and the early thirties, you know through reoccurring droughts, um, through the Great Depression. I mean, again, large geographical area. Um, we're on the very eastern side of the province. You know, kind of sandwiched between Save Medicine Hat and and Wainwright and Provost we're a very, very arid part of the province and very prone to drought. And so it's it's hard to make a living out here. Um, again, the rationale on creating this structure was to to create stability. And I think we still provide that. And I, you know, um, I'll talk about the, the public land side here and the benefit of having a special areas. And, you know, you and I were chatting offline before we got onto this interview. And, and we talked about, you know, maybe a perception out there beyond special areas that special areas is just a, a watered down version of a municipality that doesn't have a lot of teeth. Um, I do not see that at all. Um, in fact, you know, on the public land side, like one of the benefits of special areas is the province has allowed us to uh, maintain those revenues that are generated off public lands, like through um, grazing dispositions, uh, through cultivation leases. Uh, we, we collect all the surface revenue on oil and gas installations um utility easements those revenues stay locally and you know i think that gives the board um a lot of capacity and a lot of horsepower to do you know projects and partnerships that um i think other you know certainly urbans but even a lot of rural municipalities would struggle um you know to, to have the same type of capacity that special areas does uh, so again, I think that's what we're we're really doing is providing stability. Um, you know, let's just say that uh, you know somewhere in the future there was a decision to incorporate into in, into municipality and disband the special areas board. You know, I think one of the questions is what happens to those revenues on the public land side of things, um, and if if locally, if if we don't have those, like you know, I, I think we're we're challenged to be able to provide the services that we can. And again, just recognizing, um, you know, the 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 expanse of, of the territory that we cover. I mean, we've got over, I think it's over 6,000 kilometers of maintained roads. We've got, you know, 37 greater beats that, you know, are up and down roads every day just doing maintenance. Um, there's a cost to that, Chris, right there. Like there's, um, there's- Most of your funding expense. comes from the province though, right? Like I'm assuming, really? Because no. I'm assuming because you're public we, lands, they're giving you money no. hand over fist to try to upkeep that. We we mean like we, like I said, we we generate the revenues um, off public lands internally, and they stay here. 
But other than, you know, uh, typical funding through the province, through, you know, programs like MSI, you know, through some of those other granting streams that other municipalities get, we don't get a dime extra from the province in terms of our operations. And again, it's because we have access to the revenues off the public lands locally that stays here. Um, you know, we we charge our leaseholders on grazing lease, you know, uh, an annual rent. Um, on cultivation leases, they pay annual rent. Uh, we have annual rents on on surface revenue on oil and gas installations. Um, again, that's the benefit. Um, uh, you know, those revenues uh, on on crown land outside special areas obviously go into, you know, to the provincial treasury, um, and the province can use those for whatever, you know, programming that they they see fit. Um, so. You know, industry on crown land outside special areas is paying those rents. They pay them here too. We just maintain the revenues on that and use that, um, you know, for our operations and, and capital uh, projects and stuff like that. So does the province give us money? Uh, no, other than, you know, what they would be giving to other municipalities in terms of grant streams, MSI, you know, those types of, of funding streams. Um, but again, it's 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 uh, the public lands um, is definitely a, a big part of it. And then we've got municipal taxation. Um, so we generate municipal taxation. And again, we've been blessed with a, a, a fairly robust, um, you know, say non-residential tax base um, through oil and gas, uh, through power generation, through utilities. Um, right now, there's a big rush on renewable energy. So there's literally hundreds and hundreds of megawatts of um uh, wind towers being constructed in special areas at some point you know that adds to our assessment base wow. um so our, our revenues are really internally generated and we are not you know i'll argue this with anybody we are not being propped up by the province I want to go back to your role here for a second before I move into the second segment, which is special area boards and some of the issues that it's facing today in today's climate. But I want to know from you, because you are a provincially appointed person, the Minister yep. of Municipal Affairs appoints you as chairperson. Is this a lifetime appointment? Is this at the will of the government if they, they can rescind it tomorrow and put someone else in there? Just take me through that process because like a CAO comes and goes as the will of the council, the municipal or the provincial government can come and go and say, Jordan, we don't like you this week. You're, you're gone. So can they do that? Uh, absolutely, they can. Yeah, I am obviously a, a political, I won't say a political appointment, but I'm an, an appointment of the government, right? Um, is so, there like a, a hiring process for this? Like, do you there, just there randomly yep. apply or does someone come and tap you in the middle of the night and say, Jordan, you're getting called up to the big leagues to be the next chairperson of the special areas board? Like, through the, you know, I'll say through the, the Public Service Commission, Chris, they've got like an executive search team provincially that, you know, manages a lot of these recruitments. Um, so the, the chair, this role would go through that and be part of that. Okay. Um, so when I, well, when I, um, you know, got here, I, I went through that recruitment process. Um, and then, you know, once you get here, then it, it then, you know, you, again, it's an appointment by an, an order in council. Um, they do have terms on them. So the current appointment that I'm working on is is a four-year appointment. And prior to that, um, I had two three-year appointments. So I'll be appointed for a total of, of 10 years in this role. And then um, I should know the legislation, Chris, that that kind of, um, you know, that is, is that provides the, the guidance for this. Um, but within that legislation, um, it's to a maximum of 10 years. So um, after this last appointment of mine in 2025, I believe, or 2024, um, that will be my, you know, technically my last appointment. And then um, I, I'm not sure what happens after that. Um, I, I want to oh, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Because I wasn't going to say, I, like, like I, you know, um, I think those discussions will happen, but I mean, that's what the legislation says right now basically understandable i want to turn to segment two now and segment two is about the special area boards as a organization as an mm -hmm. entity of uh, municipal local politics and government 
I want to know from you, Chairperson Christensen, because you are the chair, you are the one who's leading this uh, this advisory council, this board. In your opinion, and for those who are about to say this is not a motion of council, it's not. This is his opinion. In your opinion, mm-hmm. what is the biggest issue facing the special areas board today? What is the biggest issue facing special areas today? Um, like, I, th- I think there's lots of issues out there, Chris, that, um, you know, have some immediacy around them. I, you know, I, I'll say that I think it's still this, um, like, slow, kind of insidious decline of rural population, right? It's that that rural-urban shift, and, and we're still seeing that here um, you know, and I just, I look across Alberta and, you know, Alberta has been blessed with so much growth. Um, and we don't see that here. I mean, locally we're, you know, we're, we're fighting to keep rural schools open. We're fighting to maintain, um, you know, doctors and healthcare facilities. Right now we've got, um, uh, the big country hospital in Oyen is under a, uh, Alberta health is calling it a, a, a temporary service disruption. So, They've closed all the acute care beds there, no emergency room between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. Um, you know, and that's not an OIN issue. I think that's a, a reflection of the, you know, the the global crunch on on healthcare workers. But again, I think it it kind of speaks to my point here that, you know, like eastern rural remote Alberta, um, you know, it, it's still that that population decline. And and you look at you know, even Treasury Board and Finance does longer term projections of, of growth forecasting across the province. So, I mean, our municipal boundary here is one of the the only ones where they they forecast long term population declines in, you know, uh, 40 years out. And uh, that's a real issue. Like, uh, you know, in our urban communities out here, we like I said, we've got schools, we've got hospitals, we've got communities. Um they might support a, a smaller population, but they support huge geographical regions. And it's just the struggle to, to maintain those services. Um, you know, I, I, I find that the, the people out here are very, very self-sufficient, uh, very, very independent. And we don't, like people out here don't ask for more than what's needed, right? Like we don't want or need advanced healthcare facilities you know, we want a hospital where if your child has pneumonia at 10 o'clock at night, you go to the hospital and, and have a doctor help you out. I mean, that that's that's what we want to see. We, uh, you know, um, hypothetically, we, we just, if if someone is sick at 10 o'clock at night in the emergency room and on you, sorry, I apologize if I pronounced that uh, town. Oyen. Oyen is closed. Where do they have to go? Well, uh, that's a big issue. Uh, you know, like there's still um, ambulatory service there, um, but the next nearest facility is uh, Medicine Hats, 200 kilometers to the south. Um, Hannah's probably an hour and 15 minutes west down Highway 9. Um, if you want to go east from Oyen, you're driving into Saskatchewan and going to Kindersley, which is an hour from Oyen. Um, the Village of Concert had a hospital. Um, it does not have an active care unit there, and it's got no emergency services. Um, it's an hour north of Oyen, um, so you'd have to drive to to Provost or, or Wainwright. Um, so again, if you need medical services, um, you know, in an emergency situation, uh, you you've got some windshield time in front of you, which is it's uh, terribly it's, unfortunate. It's we scary. we rely heavily on it, it. It is very scary and. And when Alberta Health, you know, I don't want to make this conversation about this, Chris, but, no. you know, again, it's it just because it really... I, I I didn't know. And if you want to move on, we can. It's just I, I find this a fascinating because I can well, imagine as chair, you want the best for your residents, but you're at the will and so it, the pleasure of the province as well when it comes yeah. to issues of health care and education. It just, I, you know, I think for me what it does, you know, maybe for some of your audience that isn't familiar with this, I mean, it just it demonstrates the remoteness of the region. Like, I mean, we're. You know, you don't think Alberta is very big, but there's a lot of empty miles out there, and and we're around that very eastern side. And again, it's um, you so know, it, it it what's the board doing to address this then? Because you are not the first person on this show, if you've listened, and by yeah. the time this comes out, more people will have said the exact same thing that has said population decline and retention of the current yeah. population is a big 
issue in their communities right now. Now, Edmonton is not saying that. Calgary is not saying that. But the smaller no. rural and even smaller communities are saying that. Well, what's the special area boards doing, the council doing, and the board doing to try to address that? Is there things that are in the works? Is there uh, programs that you're trying to incentivize people to come and uh, set up shop, whether it be economic development or set up a subdivision or a building a house or just moving into your, your area? Uh, so yes, 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 and yes, Chris. I think, I mean, we, like we are looking at at all those options. And I think, again, that's, you know, one of the things that I, I love working with this organization, um, you know, over the years, because they're like the special areas is, is I, I'd say, historically very good at, at partnering with, you know, urban neighbors, with some of our rural neighbors, um, and there is like this kind of, uh, I'll say, kindred community spirit around some of the stuff. And so when there's, um, you know, potential or opportunity to look at some of these, you know, initiatives to stabilize rural population or to attract new business, um, the, the advisory council, the special areas board, they've always been very, very keen to, to jump on board with, with those. Um, so looking at, at, at subdivision development, yes. You know they've they've partnered with a, a number of, of different kind of um i'll say groups around, around some of that stuff uh we've taken some of that on you know on our own initiative um you know on, on the healthcare file we've been working with you know housing foundations and alberta health services and you know kind of all the the municipal neighbors around oyen um you know to try to attract and and recruit and, and retain um, healthcare professionals to our community, um, you know. So we we uh, partnered with the Housing Foundation, uh, furnished a couple apartment suites, um, you know, made them you know extremely comfortable, very homey, very nice, you know. And the idea there is when we have some of these uh, contract nurses or foreign grad medical students that come in, um, they've got a place they can come to our community. They land, all they need to do is bring their suitcase and maybe a loaf of bread and some milk for the morning. And then they're set up from there. They don't need to worry about finding um, accommodations or furnishing it. Um, we've partnered there and, and just tried to supply that. So it's things like that. It's 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 small things that you know I think make uh, is it make working? It is. Yeah. No. And, and on the oil, um, on the the, the oil situation, Chris, like I'm optimistic that that uh, we we find resolution around there. And um, I think um, certainly one of those, like one of those apartments that we've worked on, um, they do have a, it, it's a, it's a, they call it an agency nurse, right? A contract nurse to come into the community. Um, they've, they've got um, one landed there and I think they're, you know, trying to recruit another one. Um, you know, so it's things like that, that I think, you know, kind of make our communities just a little bit different than, you know, I'll say communities, bigger centers, you know, communities along that highway two corridor, um, you know, that there's more, uh, I'd say, I want to say attraction there, but there's more of a, of a draw, right? Um, so, so, so we have to look at these, these more detailed things to, to really catch the attention of, of people that, that are coming into our community, bigger scale stuff, you know, on, on trying to, to change some of these demographic and, and economic trends that we see out there. Um, you know, currently we're working on a project in partnership with the MD of Acadia. Uh, we've got the, the GOA through um, agriculture and then the Canada Infrastructure Bank, you know, looking at, at greenfield development of, of irrigation. Um, so we've got a project that we've been working on for two years, you know, trying to, to scope out, you know, feasibility on, on it. Um, you know, looking at, you know, soils. Do we have soils that are conducive for, for irrigation? Is there water available? Uh, available? Where would we source the water from? You know, technically, can we actually build an irrigation project? Um, and again, that that's uh, that's maybe a, a longer term vision. But uh, I, I mean, I just I, I love doing the drug, Chris. If I don't, I'm not sure where you're you're. Uh, Calgary, you Alberta. Done, so so if you do the Highway Three drive, you know Tabor, Lethbridge, you know even towards Medicine Hat, that's just to me that's such an amazing drive because it doesn't matter what the provincial economy is doing, it seems like Highway 3 never slows down. It's got, you know, dry land egg, it's got irrigation, it's got value add, it's got egg processing, it's got renewable energy, it's got conventional oil and gas. 
And, and half you know the time stuff. you can drive the highway three and you can go through three different weather patterns half the time too. Exactly. Exactly right. I mean, it's just, it's kind of a neat little place. And so, you know, you, you look at communities like that and you see what irrigation has done for Brooks and Tabor and Lethbridge and, and some of these other places. And um, again, we're like, we're, we're extremely prone to drought out here. And uh, we think those soils are there for, for irrigation. Um, you know, if you had a, a stable source of, of water, um, I think that really changes the dynamics of, uh, of what happens out here. You, you talked earlier in segment in this segment about the, the wants and needs of your community. Your community, as you said, the people of the special areas boards doesn't really want much. They're, they're comfortable where they are. They're not looking for anything flashy, but they, they still have wants and needs. How do you, as the chairperson of the board and the board and the advisory council, gather the issues because if you are that big of an area i can imagine someone's issue in the most northern part of the special area board and the most southern part are going to be semi similar but they're going to have unique issues so how do you balance the the needs of so many different communities while still looking after the board in general uh you know um have you found the balance yeah. Like I, you know, I, I think, um, I think generally the theme of the issues is, is you know, pretty consistent. Like you said, there's always nuance there, and and maybe um, slight differences. Uh, you know, I lean on, you know, the input from obviously our elected advisory council. There's 13 of them, um, and they're they've got subdivisions, so they come from a specific location within special areas, and and you know, if there's something happening in the you know, northeastern corner of special areas, like, uh, you know, typically council or the board member uh, from, you know, that that part of special areas, you know, brings that forward and and we just find a way to, to resource it. Um, Are you the largest so, elected body in the province of Alberta outside the province? I, I don't know that. I'm not sure if we're the 13 largest. 13 seems elected. like a lot. <laughs> like Alberta it's doesn't quite, even like have we, 13. <laughs> we, we, like we... Uh, I mean, when we meet, we usually get like a hall space and, and then, you know, once you have, um, you know, 13 elected members there and then our, our senior management team, there's myself and, and three directors. And then we have, um, you know, a number of other support staff. So it, we, we fill a space, Chris, when we get together to meet. Um, but again, I, you know, I, I think, uh, again, that's one of the advantages of, of special areas, um, you know, as an organization, there's, um, you know, say a little over 100 full-time staff here. And then seasonally, we probably ramp up to, you know, say 250, 260, uh, somewhere in there. So there's there's a lot of capacity um, within the organization to resource some of this stuff. And I think, you know, just, you know, your question about dealing with issues and, and how do you resolve some of these. Um, again, I I just, I find that the, the special areas board has, I mean, they're just an example of, like, um, you know, local municipal partnerships. And I think we leverage, you know, partnerships with, you know, we, we try to work with, like, instead of fighting Alberta Health Services on, you know, the temporary closure of OIN. I mean, our approach has been like, what do you need from us? Like, what can we do to help you work through the situation? Like, you guys, you need to take responsibility for your pieces of this. But, you know, we don't want to get in your way of that. What can we add value here with? What can we help out with? Um, you know, on the education side, I mean, if we need to, we partner with our local school divisions. We've got two school divisions uh, within special areas. Well, actually three, because uh, we do have um, a, a Catholic school division here as well. Um, and, and we'll partner with our school divisions um, to find, you know, I think innovative solutions on on any kind of number of issues that, that we might have. And and uh, you know, share similar kind of uh, goals with. So okay, I think it, it... you've opened my Pandora's box here, and I know I say that a lot on this show, but every time someone says something that literally goes, "I'm about to go down a rabbit hole," I say Pandora's box. You are a large area. You are a massive area, probably the largest uh, area in all of Alberta, electedly uh, for landmass wise. Um, that means you are surrounded by a lot of. MDs, a lot of counties, a lot of towns, a lot of cities. How many inter uh, intermunicipal agreements do you have with all these municipalities that surround you? Because I know like even where I used to work, Slave Lake had one and it took them like three years to get it 
like finalized, I can imagine working with so many others, it's a lot harder. We, I think, you know, you had to ask that question. I think we have 17. Oh, geez. I think we have 17 municipal neighbors that we share boundaries with. Um, and, you know, when, when that became part of the requirements under the MGA uh, for the intermunicipal collaboration frameworks, uh, like it was important work. It, it certainly was, but we, I mean, again, locally, we viewed that as a formality. Um, it was pretty easy to to sit down with our neighbors and say what's working, what's not. Let's just capture this on a on a formalized document. Um, us writing those was it, it was probably one of the easiest things that we've had to do. Um, There's a lot of municipalities who are really angry right now at you because well, I've heard some horror not, stories. <laughs> no, and I, I agree. I've heard some of those those same horror stories, Chris. And and that's not to say that there's not conflict out there. Um, like there's certainly probably disagreements. But again, I, you know, it's it for us, it's, you know, just getting together and, and sitting down and, and working through that. And and, um, you know, and again, I think the board, you know, we. Uh, you know the specialties board. I, I I think is is generally pretty gracious and 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 humble in a lot of ways. And um, again, we have a we have a strong assessment base. Um, you know, it's like for our for our region, we we think that it it it's it's a pretty pretty solid assessment base from which to generate taxes on. And and you know we uh, you know we need to do our job in in working with our urbans again, recognizing that our urbans. They do not have that same strength in terms of an assessment base. Um, and obviously, if you're a municipality, your revenue is, you know, hinged on, you know, what your assessment base is and, yeah. and what you can tax it at. Um, you know, so we recognize that and say, like, what, how do we help out support, um, you know, recreation facilities, uh, you know, some of, some of those things that, you know, our residents are coming, you know, into your community to use. So... I want to end on this question for this segment, and it's an important one for me because I always look look to the future. I never look backwards. I look to the future. Um, at the end of 2023, I usually put together a month-long series in December of where are they now? What has happened mm -hmm. since we last talked? So if I was to call you in December and say, hey, Jordan, what's up? Long time no talk. Remember me? I was that podcast host that you came on. Um and I said, have you got X done that you talked about in our episode? What would be X for you? What is the special area of boards looking at getting accomplished in 2023 or getting off the ground in 2023 to move the special areas board forward? What would be there? Uh, that is a really good question, Chris. I mean, again, I like I think there's a hundred different things that have some immediacy around them. I mean, very, uh, you know, I'll say localized concern is is the Oyen Hospital that we talked about. Like, we would like to see that, you know, back up, um, you know, to to full operations. Like, let's get the 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 acute care uh, open back up. Let's get emergency services there. Let's stabilize, you know, that facility. Um, you know, I, I think that's a big thing. Uh, again, the, the irrigation stuff that we've been working on, uh, December is probably too soon to phone me and ask me that, Chris, like in that project, you know, we, we need a little bit more time on that. Um, but I, I would like to see that one further down the road and, uh, you know, closer to, you know, perhaps I'll say, a, 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 uh, you know, a, a decision to proceed with something more concrete on the project, right? I mean, Right now, we're still, you know, well, I don't want to say investigating it, but we're, you know, trying to, um, you know, go through a lot of the the technical and, and regulatory pieces to get a, a large public infrastructure build like this off the ground. Um, so in December, I'd, I'd like to see that advanced um, again to, to a point that, that we think is more concrete. Um, you know, so I think those are two things that come to mind immediately. Um, but beyond that, you know, there's a, there's a probably a whole bunch of, of little things that are going on that, you know, we, we would like to, to have wins on, but, um, you know, those are a the lot big of those, ones. Chris, you, those are the big ones and, and you know how local government works. I mean, so much of this stuff is, is really a lot, so much of it's just out of our control. Right. And you only worry about the things that you can control and the stuff that, that you can't, they're, they're nice to haves, but, uh, if you get the win, awesome if you don't 
yeah, I mean, there's other factors at play here. Move on to the next thing. So, so I want to turn to our last segment, and this is my favorite segment because, as someone who has prided themselves as being a tourist who likes touring Canada, I'm going to be mm-hmm. visiting the special areas board, and I'm going to be visiting some of the tourist spots that you're about to mention. So, with listeners and viewers from across Canada and around the world, if they were to be coming to Alberta and to the special area boards, what are some of the hidden gems in your community that people need to stop and see? What are some hidden gems? Well, I'll tell you what, if you're a golfer, Concert has just a beautiful little golf course up at Gooseberry Lake Provincial Park. Um, you need to hit that, Chris, because it is certainly a gem. Like for a, it's it's kind of out. Is it a nine or 18? I've got to ask. Nine. It's okay. nine. Much better. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, it's just, it's a really, really nice course. Um, if you're, uh, um, if you're an ice fisherman, uh, we've got a reservoir at Carol, we call it Carrollside Reservoir. Um, if you're a pike guy, uh, they haul some lunkers out of uh, Carrollside Reservoir. It's kind of south of, um, you know, kind of in between Hannah and Oyen, uh, south along Highway 570. Um, camping, if you're a camper, we've got a really nice uh, municipal campground at Prairie Oasis Park. And it's actually um, built you know, just kind of um, outside the back door of the Heartland uh, generating station. Um, so it's natural gas fired uh, power generating station south of Hanna. Um, so it's it's basically built on the, the cooling pond. So um, if you've got a boat, you can go down to the, kind of the far end where the water, the the water that's went through the plant comes out and it's just like a bathtub and, and got a really nice campground there. Um, it's it's quite nice. Um you what know, about yourself, also, though? What about yourself? Where do you go after a long day, after a stressful day? If you've listened to the show, you know I'm about to ask this question. Well, you can't I, say your own house, so you have to say somewhere in the that, community. That I, gonna, <laughs> I like, so I also farm. I like I grew up on a farm south of Moyen, um, and I, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a prairie guy, so I I I love getting out on, you know, some of my favorite places in special areas are you know, kind of off the, the back trails, um, you know, you, you get onto some of these undisturbed, uncultivated native grassland landscapes. And I, I love getting out there. Um, there's some spots on top of the Red Deer River on the north side that uh, you get out there and, and you look out over top of the Red Deer River. It's pretty spectacular, uh, Chris, really nice, nice spots to be on. And and even if you get south, like through Jenner and Buffalo, um we still operate some community pastures and, and there's a, a, a pasture about 50,000 acres. We call it Buffalo Alley Community Pasture and it borders right up against uh, CFP Suffield against the military base in Southern Alberta. And you get down, down in through there and, and you get on. You go on some that far down? There. Yeah. Yeah. We border right against CFP Suffield on the south end. So south of the Red River. So I was um, literally right beside you last weekend. <laughs> I could have just hop, right? yeah, that's... hop, skip, and jump over to yeah. the north of the, the CFP. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I'm I'm a prairie guy, so I get on you know some of those uh, um, you know undisturbed native prairie pastures and get on a hilltop. I that's kind of that's kind of my jam out there. I want to end on. Oh, actually, I'm going to end on this question that I'm going to ask my final question. What is the biggest misconception that special area boards hears on a regular basis? I know you, you we jokingly talked about it a little bit earlier and in the pre-interview, but for you, what's the misconception and what do you want to dispel about the special area boards? Um, well, you know, and I think you and I kind of, again, talked a little bit about this before we, we got on the call here, just, you know, like the perception that special areas is really a, a watered down municipality. Um, you know, I hear that. You quite pass often. a budget, you do all that, right? We do all that stuff. We do all that stuff. And I like, granted, we've got to stick a candle through the department, like through municipal affairs. I mean, um, you know, there, there's uh, there's process in there and I respect that process. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's certainly people out there that might think that my role, because I'm appointed by the province, you know, I'm, I'm under the thumb of a minister. Um, I, like, I've, I've never felt that the Department of Municipal Affairs or a minister, I've been under the thumb um, of any of them. Uh, you know, again, we, we have, uh, you know, occasionally we, we disagree on, on policy. Um, and, um, but what I've always found is that, 
Um, we've had a very respectful relationship with the department, um, like totally open door policy. If I need access or the board needs access to a minister, um, you know, we're just a, a phone call or, or a drive away or a visit from the minister out to Hannah or concert or Oyen. Um, so I've never felt like, you know, we've been under the thumb of, and I think sometimes there's that perception because, oh, well, you know, you're, you're appointed by government. Um, you know, there's maybe that, that sentiment that, that they just dictate to you how things should be. Um, and, and I don't find that again, Chris, I mean, I, you know, sometimes we, we disagree on, on policy or, or, or whatever. Um, but, but it's always for the have... best for the residents, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to end on this because we are at the 50 minute mark and I know you're a busy person and I want to know in your opinion, and you can take as long as you want to answer this question, what makes special areas such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Um, Well, I I think that's, uh, you know, I don't want to say that's an easy answer for me, but I think it's stuff that we've talked about already. Like I just, I love the, you know, the, the independent, self-sufficient nature of, of people out here i mean they don't they don't ask for a whole lot um they're they're very content and um but you know having said that if yeah if something if if they you know if their hospital closes or their school closes they're going to let you know about it but i think um you know i i think there is a very strong sense of um you know self-sufficiency and independency and uh the, that comes along with this and, and i think you know like as as much as the sparse population can be a challenge, like I, um, you know, if, uh, if if people maybe aren't necessarily your thing, like there's some open space out here, like there's there's room to, um, um, you know, to live your life, and and I I really appreciate that as well, um, and it's you know I I think you know we're we're on the eastern side of the problem we're all prairie right, and you get north you know up along Highway 12 and then through Special Areas 4 and up around concert and you know it does get into more of that that aspen parkland but um like i said there's a lot of um uncultivated undisturbed landscape out here which you know i i think if you're into that if you're a prairie person um you know between us and, and southeastern alberta through cypress county and 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 40 mile uh man oh man if prairie's your thing this is this is where it's at there's cultivation, there's farming out here too, but there's a lot of miles of uh, of uh, grasslands. Jordan, Chair Christensen, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor to actually learn about special areas boards from A, the person who actually is the chairperson of that, and B, to actually understand it a lot better than I did going into this interview. So thank you so much. And I really hope my listeners and my viewers understand what the special areas boards does, but also how it is still a local government. It's still like your municipality, still like your county. So thank you so much for doing this. Well, you're very welcome, Chris, and I hope I did it justice. I hope I didn't just confuse or, or muddy the waters around what special areas is or, or what we do. Um, I, you know, again, I, I, uh, I to me, I, I don't want to say I take it for granted, but it's just inherent in what we do, and it's just it's it's quite normal for me. Um, I don't so think I'll there's admit, a lot of people in this province who know knows that there's a special areas board out there. I, no, I, I would agree, and I, you know, again, I I went to. To university in in uh, at U of S in Saskatoon, and a lot of my classmates and friends there, when, when they drive into Alberta, um, you know, from Saskatoon to Calgary, say they would hit special areas, and they always ask me, "What is special areas?" Like they just assumed that it was some kind of nuclear testing range or something like that. Like they had no idea, right? And I'd say, you know, they, then you have to give them the story. But um, yeah, there there's uh, just a lot of unknown out there. So I, I hope I gave it their um uh, did it justice in my explanation chris you you did and i look forward to driving through special areas later on this month we're heading off to saskatoon so i'm looking forward to and we may stop in and see some of these tourist spots that you said but thank you so much for sitting down and talking to us today so with that, I want to remind everyone, go put down social media, go put down social media for five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody helps their society, helps their democracy and helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been the cross border interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember everyone just keep talking.